Welcome to this episode of Stanford Medicine Next Live for Tuesday, March 4th, 2014. This program is a weekly live recorded broadcast and tweet chat from the organizers of Stanford Medicine X, a conference that explores the intersection of emerging technology and medicine. The views and opinions expressed on this broadcast are those of the individual participants and not necessarily those of the Stanford University School of Medicine or the conference organizers. If you are joining us for the first time, a quick reminder that there is a simultaneous conversation happening on Twitter right now using the hashtag MedX. Sarah Kucharski, otherwise known as Afternoon Napper, is the moderator of today's episode and will be taking questions from social media. So please make sure to start up your Twitter client to join in the online conversation and interact with today's speakers. Please also make sure to like our Facebook page at www.facebook.com forward slash Stanford MedX. Please note, you are watching a live online program and there is a delay between real time events and the live stream that you are watching. Tweets from our in-studio guests will appear before you see the real-time events they are tweeting about unfold on the video live stream. The topic of today's show is Glass Plus Medicine. Is wearable computing ready to revolutionize medicine? In this episode, we are going to be exploring how wearable computing devices, such as Google Glass, fit into the healthcare innovation landscape. What unique problems might wearable computers solve for patients and physicians in healthcare? What are the challenges facing adoption of these devices by patients and providers? How could bringing glass into the clinic, bedside, or the everyday life of patients improve the care that they receive? With us today is a diverse panel of patients, physicians, and technologists with expertise in wearable computing, many of whom are developing for the glass platform. The goal of this program is to hear from them, have them share with us their views on these issues, and of course, to answer your questions out there from our viewing audience on Twitter. Tonight, it is, uh, it is March 4th, and tonight we are uh, with a, with a great group of folks talking about wearable devices in the care setting. Specifically, we're going to speak tonight a lot about Google Glass, and we're going to talk about uh, what's working, what, uh, what we think about the, the future and what it might hold for wearable devices like Google Glass, and we're going to talk about some of the pragmatic uses for maybe patients and uh, caregivers as well, and, and uh, as well as maybe some of the taboo subjects, some of the things that... Um, that might make glass a little less practical for health. So we're really going to dig into all sides of this tonight. My name is Nick Dawson, and I'm excited to have a really, really great group of panelists with us tonight. And I'm going to introduce them in order, and then we're going to jump right in. So Noble Ackerson is founder of LinksFit, where he enables healthy lifestyles with the help of wearable computers. And Noble has been uh, doing really innovative stuff with software and Google Glass and fitness and sports health and does a lot of stuff in the big data space. So, Noble, welcome and thanks for joining us. Raphael Grossman is a general surgeon who specializes in trauma care and works with uh, la la <laughs> excuse me, laparoscopic work and, uh, and da Vinci and other surgical robot techniques. He's a MedEx uh, faculty member and a TEDx speaker and a healthcare technology innovator. He's been a Google Glass explorer and he and I were speaking earlier um, I remember when Dr. Grossman presented at Doctors 2.0 last year and was a very early uh, Google Glass explorer. He's a big believer in mobile health and wearable technologies and cloud-based platforms. He sees all of these things with deep learning systems uh, and uh, in the internet and how they'll disrupt healthcare as we know it and medical education for that matter. And Dr. Grossman, that'll probably be really applicable when we talk about um, some of the, uh, the, the patient-centered disruptions that might happen, as well as the provider-centered ones. Great to uh, be Chris here. Thank you very much. Glad you are. Christian Assad is a Interventional Cardiology Fellow uh, at the University of Arkansas uh, uh, Medical Center. He is the CMO of uh, Perens, and, and I might be mispronouncing that. We'll get you to weigh in here in a minute, Dr. Assad. Uh, 
coordinator. He's a coordinator of medical innovation and technology at the Institute of Technology at Monterey, Mexico, and the editor and curator of Singularity University's exponential. Uh, ex uh, exponential medicine e-magazine and social network and you know maybe uh, that idea of some of Singularity's work uh, will come into play as well so we're glad uh, glad you're joining us tonight thank you Oliver right <laughs> Oliver uh, Alami is a uh, vascular surgeon at Stanford and a co-founder of Vital Medicals whose vision is a uh, Google Now like experience for the peri perioperative arena. So if you know about Google Now and its heads-up display in those cards and that kind of always-on information, uh, that's the kinds of things he's working on. Thank you very Pierre, much. Glad to be here. Glad you're here. Uh, Pierre Theodore is a cardiac uh, surgeon in the Van Auken Endowed Chair of Thoracic Surgery at UCSF Medical Center. He's the founder of uh, the Parnassus Medical health IT firm dedicated to creating collaborative networks for clinicians involved in multidisciplinary care. And that's a mouthful, but it's certainly the kinds of things that Medicine X uh, is highly aligned with. We love the idea of multidisciplinary care. Um, and is involved uh, 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 in a variety of efforts to apply technology to pressing problems in modern health care locally and globally. So, uh, Pierre, when we get into maybe some of the socioeconomic questions, um, it sounds like that'll be right up your alley. So thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Well, guys, I'll, uh, gang, I'll remind us that this is a this is a conversation that happens in two places. First, it happens here amongst our chat, and it'll also happen online with our tweet chat using the hashtag MedX, N E D X. So we'll we'll be largely influenced by our audience tonight. But I want to begin. Uh, by asking you folks as researchers and innovators and providers, what's working uh, today with Glass? What are, what are the things you're doing today? And maybe Dr. Grossman, uh, since I've heard you speak before, I'll let you start. Sure. Well, thanks for the invitation again. You know, it's uh, I think that it's uh, so uh, so such a, a wide variety of things that are happening with Glass nowadays. Uh, you know, more and more people is is uh, a, a, you know, have access to glass now, and and more and more people in the healthcare industry and and uh, surgeons and non-surgeons uh, alike. Uh, and I think that uh, people is just having ideas and and uh, thoughts about how to use it and going ahead and 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 if they have glass, just uh, start uh, applying those ideas. And if they are uh, either coders or developers or have access to developers start using that. You know, uh, about a year ago when, when I first got uh, exposed to glass, uh, it was just a matter of thinking how incredible it would be to use it in the operating room and in healthcare in general for, for surgical uh, uh, purposes. And, uh, you know, it was just a matter of weeks uh, after that when I got glass and then started using it and, you know, was the first one to use it in the operating room for the first time. And, and it was amazing. And then after that, the buzz and the and the excitement about using glass for almost anything in healthcare, it's uh, it's been um, it's been really uh, really interesting. Uh, in the uh, operating room, has obvious uh, uh, um, obvious uh, uses. You know, from from transmitting data to uh, doing a telemetry to a medical education a, 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 a exponential a, a, a improvement. I think that. Uh, we have uh, it, uh, it done a proof of concept videos uh, in regards to how to use it uh, in in the medical education setting, and the students just go crazy about that. It's it's just a, a, a being able to show the students the perspective of a, a surgical procedure and go step by step, uh, with or without cards in glass, to to show them the procedure just by being able to remotely bring them to the surgical uh, procedure setting uh, with the help of glass uh, it's something that that excites uh, the students and and uh, and uh, we have been working quite a bit on that as well as trying to do telementoring you know teaching someone how to do a procedure or helping someone how to do a procedure or asking for help when we are doing a procedure all those proof of concept uh, uh, situations you know scenarios have been done and and it's been uh, you know really really uh, exciting. Noble, um, I, w I wonder in your work with LinksFit, um, when I hear Dr. Grossman talk about um, medical education, what are the 
kind of what are the applicabilities you're seeing uh, for telementoring, maybe maybe wider than just medical education? Yeah, from my work, uh, I'm approaching um, this stuff from the outpatient's perspective, and and we are, you know, essentially helping uh, these um, patients uh, get better, uh, and and while allowing their physical therapists. Uh, to track uh, their progress to health in real time and obviously give them a real live human motivation even if they might be halfway across the world. I think it's uh, it's extremely powerful when you know unlike what we have now where you have you know, a doctor or physical therapist give a piece of paper to an outpatient or email them details as to what to do in order in the case of cardiac arrest, uh, cardiac um, rehab, in order to get back uh, from a heart attack, um, what we're doing, you know, equips the patient with the device and um, a library of content specific uh, to their recovery, and uh, using the sensors available in the wearable device, we are sort of, um, you know. You know, using a little bit of artificial intelligence to to help coach them, but they always have that human support, uh, you know, behind in their sales, right? To to help them, you know, cross that threshold when when they wake up and and things are harder than normal. Oliver, how's the um, how's the Google Now like interface working today? What do you so, what do you see happening? Yeah, that's 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 the big vision. Um, you know, I think. You know, I love the comments from Raphael and Noble um, both, and really everyone's still exploring and, you know, through the daily uh, experiences coming up with areas that we feel like we need to work on. I mean, for me, it just so happens that in my environment, um, when I'm doing angiograms in IR, we don't have enough vital sign monitors um, around the room, and it's often the case that the nurse has to leave the room um, to the go to the Pixis machine to get medication in order to um, you know just to medicate the patient and so there are all, there are many instances when no one's really looking at the patient's uh, vital signs um, and so for for me for us it was it was important to get the vital signs stream to glass that seemed like an, a useful thing and so that's some, an integration we were able to do the Google Now part is way down the road we think. Uh, glass is going to be through the low energy Bluetooth and the um, iBeacon that's built in. It's not enabled yet, but hopefully with the next version of Android uh, that they release, it'll be enabled. You can do crazy things where you can walk through the ICU and just get the data that's pertinent to your routine. You know, when I, when I start a case, I have a routine. I want to see my last note. I want to see the imaging. I want to see the labs, uh, the most recent labs, and that's just my routine. And I could build that in and just walk in and know that this is Joe Smith and and these are the things that um, I'd like to see. Um, so it's really a big vision, um, but um, there are a lot of interesting things. You know, getting pages. What what really I think is going to be incredible. You know how mobile has changed uh, the world for everybody. Well, bringing mobile to the OR to the operating uh, operative field is is pretty unique. Um, you know, getting pages to glass, for example, um, it's so common. So often, nurses don't want to answer your pages, and they could be important. And I, and often the residents are having to beg for the uh, nurses to call back. So there are a lot of great use cases. You know, um, you know, I want to I want to take a minute and um, ask for our, our audience forgiveness. I, I've not done a great job as a moderator. In fact, I was thinking today. I actually had a doctor's appointment today and had to had to stop my uh, doctor twice and say, "Can you tell me how to spell that?" Um, because I'm not clinical, and there are a lot of times that I think that that especially for those of us that are kind of inside on something, we can forget that there's a whole group of people who don't have that same experience. And we've got a lot of folks tuning in right now who have that, that's a good analogy, who in this case, it's not because they're not clinical, they've never seen glass, they've never used it, we've got to remember that we're a, we're a small niche group here. So I'm wondering if somebody would be willing to take us back to the start and explain um, it kind of very fundamentally, what is glass, what does it look like, what's the experience like? 
Absolutely, I, I love to pitch in if uh, people don't mind. I, I, what Please. I usually tell people is uh, that uh, a glass is uh, like having a smartphone in front of your eye. It doesn't uh, obstruct your vision, but it's really basically a, a smartphone in front of your eye. It's a small glass cube that has a very small screen, but it's the equivalent of a 28-inch 28, 28 screen is seen from uh, 6 to 8 feet away. And uh, it has the ability to uh, take pictures, a, a video, establish a video call, a text someone, call someone, tweet someone, read the New York Times, Google something, and, and plus a, a whole bunch of all new apps which are being developed right now from, from translating text to, to uh, to uh, you know, uh, geolocating and uh, help you you know uh, drive around to fitness apps like like the one Noble has developed to to a myriad of other things, uh, all by pretty much voice activation and maybe a slide uh, a, you know a, a swap on the on the frame of the glass. So uh, I would think that that summarizes uh, Google Glass uh, pretty pretty good. Pierre. Um you, you wanted to jump in here? Yeah, you know, I, I wanted to sort of comment a little bit about the, the actual use cases. You know, we took the perspective with respect to glass that there are a lot of people projecting what could happen in the future, and we said at a relatively simplistic level, what sort of trial could we run right now that would demonstrate some of the values of glass in a somewhat controlled fashion? So we took a step back and created an uh, internal review board approved trial for the use of glass in the operating room setting that required some interaction with the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, and a fair amount of back and forth interactions with UCSF's uh, internal review board to allow us to use intraoperative projections of, um, of imagery at the time, at the point of care for surgeons. And our basic premise was that, particularly in minimally invasive surgery, that there are times in which having radiographic information projected into the field of view as opposed to on a screen behind one's head or possibly in another room or on another floor might be valuable. We don't really have the endpoints where things like the length of surgery, uh, complications, and basically questionnaires that were offered to the surgeons. But we thought it was important to start to acquire some data about how glass actually influences healthcare, as opposed to really just projecting into the future as to what what might happen. Christian, yeah, I'll go here. So I I wanted to mention two things, and it's when people ask me about glass, it's I think there's two ways that it can be used, and uh, the first one is a straight out of the box. That's the easiest way that doctors can actually incorporate it, nurses, med students, residents, you name it. There was a very valid and important point uh, that was based on or touched upon, which was uh, telementoring. Now, I believe that uh, call schedule or calls can, can be completely changed if we started using glass as residents and med students. Just imagine somebody putting a central line that is not too good at doing central lines. He can actually be calling his upper level and getting some help there. Now, we, we did something like this with the essential part of glass, which was, was we were doing a PFO closure on a patient. Now, by serendipity, several things happened in this case. Uh, number one, the, the, the amp latcher device, which is a closure device for the, for the um, uh, PFO, had a clock. We saw that in the echo. But we also had the telemeter outside the cath lab who saw this. Now, he actually gave us, gave us advice on what to do, retrieve it. Obviously, we knew that. But then he also guided us on how to clean the device and basically establishing a proof of concept on how important this is. Many times as, a, as a, somebody that's doing a procedure, be it a surgeon, be it an interventional cardiologist, radiologist, uh, we search or we seek the advice or second opinion of somebody else. And if we can do it freely and quickly uh, via this means, this turns out to be very, very important. It obviously depends on the bandwidth, on, on the connection that we have in the hospitals, but uh, it, it's something that, that, depending on the situation, it uh, has, has great potential. Uh, transmitting it for uh, a live audience, this was also a very interesting 
perspective where 1,500 people recently were seeing what we were doing in the cath lab with our core valve, and, and they were very, very intrigued because they were in the first person view. So for education and telementoring, asking the advice of an expert in, in some other remote place on Earth, um, instead of him having to fly and spending money and time and whatever, I mean, this, this makes uh, things much quicker. Um, now, Christi the application... Christian. Can, yeah. I, uh, can I ask you a question? When you, sure. you speak about um, live streaming, there's some really neat applicability there. Do patients get to join that live stream as well? If they want to. Here's the thing. People are so concerned about privacy. Uh, I don't think people. I think the hospitals and the administrators, which they have the reasons why, and we have to follow them, of course. But the thing is, when you present this technology to patients, I have not had one patient that is concerned about his information being transmitted through Google Hangouts. Uh, one of the biggest concerns that the hospital administrators may have in security is that, uh, well, the information might be intercepted, might be hacked. But I haven't found one patient that actually has an argument to this. It's like, if this is going to benefit my doctor and my procedure can actually be better, sure, go ahead. And that's what we saw here. Now, when we're incorporating uh, platforms uh, to match and and basically what, one of the questions I have, somebody maybe here can answer them, we've got a Google Health apps, which are being used for medical care, which are HIPAA compliant. Why on earth is Hangout such a problem right now? If, if health apps are actually HIPAA compliant and we're actually using the same platform, it sounds to me that there's the platform is there, and, and, and just by getting other platforms out there, I will not mention names, to use all this information, there's a lag. I think once a physician uh, from any specialty uses Glass in the, in the setting, they automatically find different uses that help patients, that help their team, that help themselves. So that um, that is something that I see, and I think it. I mean, if we work together, we can just get this thing getting adopted quicker, maybe changing a little bit the rules. Maybe some won't agree, but I just want quicker change to help patients and help ourselves, you know? You know, we're, we're going to pause right there really quickly. That's a really great spot to pause because I think we've got a really, we're on the tip of a, um, a really important conversation. Pierre, I know you want to jump in. I want to ask a few more questions about some patient-centered uses. But let's take a quick moment uh, to pause and learn a little bit more about Stanford's Medicine X. Let's take a quick break to remind those of you just joining us for this episode of Stanford Medicine X Live that we are here with a panel of patients, providers, and technologists discussing the topic, Glass Plus Medicine. Is wearable computing ready to revolutionize medicine? This program is made possible by the Stanford University School of Medicine Department of Anesthesia, Stanford AIM Lab, Stanford Hospital and Clinics, and the Agency for Healthcare Research Quality. Time to take a shout out to Twitter. If you are following this conversation online or Twitter, Sarah Kucharski, also known as Afternoon Napper, is moderating the Twitter discussion on the MedX hashtag. We have with us today a panel of patients, technologists, and providers. E-patients and caregivers out there, what are the questions you have for our panelists today? How might you see wearable computers fitting into healthcare innovation? How might they empower you to be partners in your own care? What do you see as barriers to their use in the clinic or at the bedside? Healthcare providers, technologists, and researchers out there, how might wearable computers solve the problems you face in your practice? What do you see as the challenges in bringing this technology into the healthcare setting? Tweet us your questions or responses and we'll do our best to have the panel address them during this episode of Stanford Medicine X Live for Tuesday, March 4th, 2014. Welcome back. We are uh, live with Stanford Medicine X talking about Google Glass and its applicability for providers, for patients, for researchers, for innovators, for designers, all in the healthcare setting. Uh, just a few minutes ago, we were talking about that idea of live streaming, and we were we were discussing how it benefits uh, physicians and providers who want to learn and train with each other. We were also talking about how patients might use it. And Pierre, I know you wanted to weigh in on um, telementoring. I'd love to get your take on that. 
Yeah, you know, it's really more of a question for the panel as much as, a, as it is a statement, but is to, you know, take note of the fact that miniaturized head-mounted cameras, certainly in surgery and in any interventional procedure, has in one way or another been around for the better part of three decades. And so you could argue that the fact that it's on a newer device and maybe more widely available, but even the quality of Google Glass's camera apparatus is inferior to many that are available elsewhere, and yet that hasn't taken root in a widespread fashion in healthcare. So if you look at the Google Glass as having you know, two essential functions, one where it's actually taking in video uh, graphic and photographic data on the one hand, on the other hand, you're projecting data to the user, my my basic belief is that the projection of the data to the user is considerably more revolutionary than it is than using the camera function. And I guess I would wonder if we've had the technology for so many decades and it hasn't taken root, what's us what's to make us believe that the glass itself will somehow revolutionize telementoring or projecting these images around the world? You know, Pierre, if I could jump in for a sec. I think uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, what's unique about Glass is, though, again, that it's connected. It's connected, and you have access to all this data that you described um, previously, depending on how you set it up and what your use case is. Um, so I think that's where it's really unique, um, where you could get, you know, really like a Google Now type experience, where you could get um, pertinent data depending on where you are in, in the hospital. Um, who you're next to, uh, that's the potential, and that's what I think is exciting. You know, I, if I may say, say some, I, I agree with uh, with Oliver. I, I think that it's not just the the camera, obviously, which uh, as uh, as uh, you said, uh, uh, um, has been going uh, on for 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 many years. I think the fact that the camera, uh, although the the quality is not great, I think the fact that we can a live connect uh, with uh, someone virtually at a distance and be able to interact with that student or that, that physician or provider in need for our advice uh, it's just uh, what I see uh, you know most important I you know we've had the head mounted uh, um, devices and we've recorded procedures and then you get a beautiful addition of the procedure and, and really do a nice job uh, sort of uh, uh, getting the, 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 the best of all worlds but but it's not in real time, and I think having it the real time, having a, you know, being a being a, a telemedicine person, you know, we, we've been doing telemedicine for, for many years, and we use it actively uh, to to take care of patients, to save lives in some scenarios. Uh, having that ability with glass, uh, obviously, we're we're not doing it yet, you know, for telemedicine, but having that ability, the potential to do that, uh, as well as telementoring, I think is is just uh, phenomenal. And, 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 you know, it's the first uh, edition device. I'm pretty sure, you know, as we all know, you know, it's all exponential. You know, the next edition would be, you know, exponentially better, faster, hopefully cheaper. And that will address, you know, the point of, you know, this device being accessible to, to people who, who can't probably pay $1,500. So I think that the next edition, you know, will have so much, uh, a, 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 so many improvements that uh, will be all surprised. I think one of the biggest um, perks about glass, obviously, the camera is, is, as you say, it's inferior to what's been out there for a while now. But it enables uh, whoever has them in any part of the world to have access, as we were mentioning, in a very easy and cheap manner in the near future, to be speaking, contacting, and getting this telementoring advice. And I think from the most basic uh, situation um, for glass, that is its, its, its biggest perk uh, at this point in time for many people, that you can actually exchange, I believe, in the near future, that those expensive teleconference uh, settings with different cameras and just be substituted by the people that are going to be inside the OR, maybe three or four different glasses live streaming with uh, maybe, uh, uh, I don't know, I mean, uh, improving the 100 uh, megabit uh, connection or whatever you actually display then, then that can can be transferring a HD display and other stuff. Now, obviously, what you were what Pierre was mentioning, having the images in front of you, that's crucial. 
and it's very helpful. I mean, I've tried it in the past, and the way I tried it is by basically logging into a website, zooming into the angiogram, and if you have a good eyesight, as I mentioned previously, you can actually detect a pretty good angiogram there, which can be very helpful if somebody wants to uh, bypass uh, surgery, for example. Today I was speaking with a surgeon that was telling me, look at what I have to deal with, and they have a paper with, with some marks about uh, which, which vessel they're going to be intervening upon. So the platform for the user in which he's going to be able to see uh, the, the medical record, maybe some of you have it. Uh, I don't. And I think it's, it's, it's great, but it's going to take some time. And obviously, that for us is, is also going to be tremendously uh, helpful, as, as Pierre mentioned. Um. I'd like to shift gears for a moment here because it, it's uh, a little bit like we, we spoke earlier about how Google Glass and, and the Explorers are kind of a limited group. Um, being a provider is kind of a limited group. And so let's talk for a moment, if we can, about um, some patient uses and maybe maybe kind of general uh, lay, lay person, public, uh, and ordinary people uses, for lack of a, uh, a better term. So. Noble, I know that's a space you're working in. I'm wondering if you can help us start that discussion. What are some uses for um, for the rest of us? Day, you. No, sorry. So thanks for unmuting me. So <laughs> I forgot I was muted. Uh, again, uh, for for the everyday user, um, we find that uh, on a daily basis, uh, according to the CEA, I mean we're spending over a billion dollars. Are projected this year alone on wearable devices, and and we tend to sort of opt for you know apps instead of paying the seventy five dollars an hour for the personal trainer, uh, you know, um, and and also obviously going to the gym and, and finding uh, out that the equipment is too confusing to use. So for the everyday person, you know, there's a huge opportunity to leverage uh, the sensors available in these wearable devices. In order to deliver, uh, in the case of Google Glass, a, a more immersive fitness experience wherever the person uh, might be, uh, as long as they have an internet connection, uh, in some cases they they uh, have a personal fitness companion at their side. Uh, in the case of medicine, they have their uh, physician at their side um, at any point in time, and that's pretty challenging. Uh, and and in some of my work, uh, you know, recognizing that we're not replacing a personal trainer is, is very important, uh, but just sort of enabling that personal trainer to, or that uh, physical therapist or, or, um, or coach, you know, to connect uh, with, their, with their student or with their patient. Uh, and through the magic of uh, internet connectivity and the camera, as we talked about in the previous segment, uh, connect with that student and, and and you know sort of help them achieve whatever goal uh, they're they're, uh, they're they're trying to achieve. I, I want to push I want to push this a little more and um, Oliver maybe we can come back to you in just a minute. Um, Raphael, with your surgical patients, um, is there a can you imagine a a patient use maybe maybe watching something before surgery experiencing a live surgery that they might then have a week later to, for some education um, I don't know put your thinking cap on what do you see absolutely I you know that's another scenario that I've uh, described a little bit in in one of my posts uh, you know I have a healthcare blog that that uh, is about this sort of innovation technology in healthcare topics and uh, yeah you know having patients I, I use iPads frequently with my patients showing them uh, in, in either with apps or with uh, just a plain internet uh, you know the, the anatomy or 3D in, 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 in graphics of uh, the procedure we're going to do uh, trying to uh, do interaction with them and the digital world in order to, to have them understand better the procedure we're doing but uh, doing that with glass and having them uh, uh, you know maybe use glass to see what I'm explaining uh, or to interact with me even remotely uh, in regards to what we are planning to do I think is certainly a, a clear and doable possibility but more than that you know having the patient or the patient's relative, you know. Imagine again, we, we do a lot of telemedicine. Imagine a patient, a, you know, mom watching the the kids, uh, you know, 
a first uh, a, a, you know a minutes uh, a, a, of surgery or, or doing the surgery or the wake up or having a kid with glass you know l looking at mom you know when he's going to sleep or, or how that I mean the, the creativity is really the limit to what we can do with a device like this I think those are those are great uh, comments and I agree but I think there's also uh, I mean Pierre mentioned earlier the potential for research uh, using glass and if you intersect you know a patient wearing glass who's just had a cabbage going through rehab with uh, research and you know, you've got amazing opportunities where you can see, you know, people, you know, you can kind of track, are the patients actually performing their rehab uh, exercises? And if so, um, is that meaningful and how meaningful and how important is it? Are the results better? So there's amazing, uh, amazing potential for patients uh, to be tracked post-surgery or even to see um, if, um, if the results were, uh, were good or not. Yeah, the event. I'm sorry to sort of jump in here. The that's a very, very good point, and uh, Oliver, and actually sort of branches into sort of the big data sort of mindset uh, when you start thinking en masse. Uh, we've got you know sensors in a lot of these devices. Google Glass has a, its own accelerometer, or GPS, and when you combine and sort of mine those, you know every micro movement that the patient does uh, can be captured in an X, Y, and Z. Uh, axis uh, and it's not perfect because it's head mounted but you can definitely map and try to predict how well a person is doing uh, um, you know a certain activity and that's uh, that's that's huge for uh, for the caretaker um, and and for pretty much all the stakeholders involved in that person's life now, something that I see also happening is right now we have these sensors, but uh, just in a couple of months we are seeing how earphones are now able to detect your pulse. Uh, some even give you a, a reading like um, the Alive Core is doing to a certain extent, uh, pulse oximeter, thermometer, or temperature. Now, this incorporates to the, to the um, sensors that uh, Noel was mentioning. I mean, we are opening a Hunian realm for patient monitoring and doing the right thing in a preventive uh, manner. Now, initially, I think one of the biggest things uh, here is the augmented reality that glass gives you and hopefully making the exercise far more exciting than it used to uh, used to be. Some people don't like running. Now there's people are creating an application which is a zombie chase. Uh, that can also be helping or whatever it motivates to a different individual. But if you, if you see this, now kids have a reason why to go outside again and play laser tag with their Google Glass. I mean, some people are not too fond of giving them technology at such an early age, but this is the world we live in. And I believe this technology can be used to create the games for these guys to get really healthy in a very enjoyable manner, which I would be more than glad to use. So those are things that can help a patient. Also, once at the end of the conversation that you're having with the patient, you tell them, this is the three points that you should take, this is what we're doing, and this are the medications that we're changing. Instead of getting the phone, which can be cumbersome, he can be recording or making a list, like uh, the application that uh, Rafael has. It, it just depends once the patients start using them, they'll find more uses to it, more and more things that they want to modify. And I think that's the beauty of it, that um, we as doctors and we as patients, we're figuring out. Yeah. Here's a, let me throw this out. Um, how, would, how would anybody feel of if, if I was a patient and I came to your clinic or your office wearing glass and said, can I record the visit? Actually, I think it's a very important use case potentially in as much as and there are several companies that have been active in this space of trying to so-called memorialize the visit in the uh, outpatient setting. And, and I think most of us, I think Raphael was mentioning earlier about using iPads and trying to kind of capture some sort of data which we provide to our patients. And, and there are a whole series of companies, whether it's GIF.com and others, that have really tried to work on memorializing the events that happen in outpatient settings. So personally, I think it's, it's quite reasonable to expect a patient to want to record and I, now, granted, I'm at UCSF where the patients may be a little bit forward-thinking, perhaps, but I would say 20% of my patients in some manner or another will record. They'll bring someone in, have a, some kind of a, 
a collaborative event by bringing family in, or they'll actually just literally record what I say in the outpatient setting. I, uh, you know, definitely, I, I think that uh, I would not really have any problem with having the visit recorded. I, I, I really think that it doesn't really matter, you know, you, you, you're going to be sued anyway, almost, <laughs> and uh, it doesn't really matter, <laughs> but I really think that it will improve the, uh, the, the, the quality of the visit, you know. Initially, it will be a change of culture, and some people would, would probably get nervous about being recorded, say physicians, non-physicians, you know, regular providers, PAs, or nurse practitioners, uh, but we have this, we had the same problem when we uh, do telemedicine. When we started doing telemedicine, we had some of the... Uh, uh, outside, you know, the remote sites, being really uh, wary and really uh, nervous about uh, being live, uh, being watched live by big brother or big sister, you know, and, and now they love it. So I think that the same thing applies. Uh, 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 recording a surgery, you know, we record surgeries all the time. I mean, Oliver and, and Pierre would, would, would uh, uh, you know, I think uh, agree with me that, that recording a surgery is not like you... you that record stays there sometimes, and it doesn't go as part of the uh, electronic medical record, at least in my my place. But but it's a record that potentially could be could be you know asked for 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 a lawyer by a lawyer. Uh, so I, I really think that it will improve the way we do care if we had a recording of the visit, and it will improve the experience for both the patient and eventually the provider. I have a, a pretty, and this is a great, uh, great question, Nick. I mean, uh, my wife and I are expecting uh, this summer, and obviously, as a, a brand new father, I have, um, I've had a lot to learn. So, in this example, I am the patient that goes into the, um, into the, the, the nurse's office with uh, my Google Glass device. And I ask permission uh, to capture the, uh, the words of wisdom that they may impart here and there, obviously, in order to record it and take it home and digest it so I don't miss anything. Uh, there are a lot of details, as uh, some of you fathers might already uh, know. And, and so that, that, that's sort of how I sort of approach that. Um, also, um, you know, sort of... Go, you know, taking the patient, the outpatient, sort of going home and being able to sort of keep tr track of their prescriptions, uh, to be able to uh, to go through their life and sort of get wellness tips and 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 the like. Maybe a subscription to some sort of informational service that is relevant to them. I mean, we talked about eye beacons. Uh, imagine uh, someone going through some sort of recovery and having uh, a certain type of sensor. Uh, that is compatible with glass or their cell phone uh, and then to glass that reminds them that it's time to take this medicine or not mix this prescription with that. Uh, I, we think that uh, um, that sort of opens a new type, you know, new possible uh, or new possibilities rather um, for, for patients in self-care. Oh. Just one quick, one quick comment. It's it's the patients already. I, I I'm sure the other providers have experienced this as well. Patients are already, at least family members are always coming in with uh, recorders, or often, because they want to be able to, again, tell tell the details of the visit to other family members, brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts that may have some or want to help make you know important decisions for the family members. That was it. So I I think this is good. It's, Glass is going to enable this even more, which I think is great. Noble, there's also been um, uh, some suggestions that maybe you live stream the birth, and we could do that as one of these Medicine X Hangouts, and you know, I, I think we're probably totally for this idea. But I, I want to ask, um, I, I want to ask us to again. I'm, I want to challenge the the uh, dialogue a little bit here because we've gone from talking about some very provider-centered uses, which are really avant-garde and neat in the in the telementoring and the ed medical education field. And we talked a little bit about um, 
the ways that providers and patients and patients and providers, depending on kind of who uh, owns the relationship, can interact with each other. What about what about patients totally on their own? What about self care? What about patients helping each other? What about um, support groups? Anybody have either some examples or uh, some thoughts about this? Uh, Christian, what what comes to mind for you? The first thing that comes to mind was my daughter. And here's the thing: my the first time my wife lets my daughter with me and um, to take care of her, I, I take her to a pool. She's um, an hour away, my wife, and she falls. She opens her chin, and I'm like, for the love of God, she, not, not five minutes had gone by. I don't consider my, myself a bad father, but that happened. So um, here's the thing. My, my, sequence, my sequence here was take it to the ER. It's going to be a wait there. It's going to be a nightmare. She's going to get scared. I don't have a, a way to drive my kid who's crying, bleeding at that point in time. And I had some Dermabod, which is basically fancy super glue at my place. <clears throat> so I take my kid. I, I mean, it's a very simple thing. Wash, put a little bit of Dermabond, and just put it over and close it. This is something that anybody can do. Uh, this is not something that um, I consider, um, I mean, like a top-notch surgery. I mean, it's something simple. We do it, uh, I'm, from, I'm originally from Mexico, so maybe somebody here is going to say something about it. But uh, it's, it's something that I believe that can help a lot of people avoid unnecessary ER costs. And it could be actually be live streamed uh, or uh, a tutorial video in class in which it guides the parent how to do that uh, that particular step. It's it's very simple, and and same thing could apply for um, other reasons. Oh, Noble is also mentioning about uh, CPR glass, which uh, we're working upon. Um, and what what this does is is an example of this for somebody that does not know how to do uh, CPR, proper CPR, they put on glass. And what happens here is, first of all, the staying alive music comes up. Why staying alive? Because it guides you with a 100 rate per minute compression rate. Now, uh, with Lucian Angleton, we actually we merge CPR glass, and we have the largest AED database uh, at this point in time merged with glass. The whole point of this is for you when you're giving the compressions that you know where the nearest defibrillator is. In addition, calling 911, which is still not activated. We're actively working on that before uh, unnecessary um, calls happen. But all of those are applications, tutorials, videos that can help people at a particular point uh, in time to give uh, life-saving CPR or a simple uh, avoidance of a, a stitch in the three-hour wait in the emergency department. I... Uh... I'd like to, to comment a little bit on the, on the patient's perspective and on the potential uses also. You know, we, we do have a, a lot of patients, uh, all, all medical providers, but maybe more so as surgeons. We, we have patients who, who have chronic wounds, for example, uh, or chronic uh, drains or tubes that they have to take care of at home. And uh, having glass to be able to uh, uh, connect with the provider remotely uh, it would really improve uh, not just their experience, but the care of, of their own problems or any relatives' problems. For example, patients who have a, a wound that, that needs to travel to the doctor's office to have a five-minute check to see what the wound is looking like uh, so that, that you know, there, uh, there can be a decision on, on changing care or, or finishing care or whatnot. If that could be done with glass, and I think glass, it would the benefit would be that, that you're giving a, a, a real a eye side perspective of, of the wound a, a, and then you're connected in real time with a provider you know a, a virtually that can be anywhere a, so I think that that's a, a potential use you know patients who have a, a feeding tubes for example tubes to to get nutrition you know, tubes in their stomach and uh, those tubes are many times they get dislodged and uh, some patients and uh, uh, or some relatives might be there uh, enough to, to just uh, if they have enough guidance in a live setting you know from someone who has the expertise they'd be able to just replace that tube or, or, or whatnot without having to go to the ER and wait for three hours and get charged a, a several hundred dollar bill so I think that uh, that's another potential use that that it, it's it's imminent uh, to, to happen 
Raphael, maybe I could jump in right after that, just to dovetail with respect to global medicine projects, is that, you know, the World Health Organization has estimated within the next 20 years there's going to be roughly a 14 million person deficit in healthcare providers globally. And so the fact is that there are many community health workers who really have roughly about a high school or maybe first year of college sort of level of education, relatively moderately educated. And this group of community health workers, in fact, faces roughly 2 billion of the world's population. So the potential to have tools that can actually, if you will, kind of communicate back to actual skilled healthcare workers is truly a potential groundbreaking advance for low-cost wearable devices. So I do think that there are, there are versions of what you, you described that can address true global pain points that exist because of the lack of adequate providers around the globe. Absolutely. I agree 100%. Uh, we've, we've got a neat question uh, from Philip Jeffrey via Twitter who asks, could Google Glass be useful in helping uh, lab technicians, maybe phlebotomists as well, um, find difficult to see veins during uh, a blood draw? And I, I want to spin that a little bit, and I want to ask if, if Google Glass could help um, a phlebotomist or a lab tech see veins, couldn't it help, uh, couldn't it help anybody see veins? Are there... So, so think about that for a second. If there was augmented reality, if it could teach me to use Dermabond or, or, or stitch up a wound, does that enable a whole different type of care? Noble, uh, maybe you want to jump in. Sure. Um, not my field of expertise, but by itself, Google Glass um, wouldn't be able to do that, right? Um, you would have to um, build software to then overlay uh, where you know a normal human's veins would go. The best way I think uh, to do that would be with the help of a, uh, a third-party uh, hardware device and that's a, a great opportunity for someone to go make millions of dollars. Uh, and you will be able to get more accurate you know by actually physically scanning uh, the person's uh, um, vein or area uh, you'd be able to get a little bit more accurate uh, uh, reading as to where the veins are, and then you can th you can then uh, paint or or sort of reanimate uh, where the accurate locations uh, of whatever uh, vitals that you're looking for on your glass device, and obviously project that wherever else might be useful for for any other uh, um, surgeons or whoever uh, may may be looking at that, uh, but. You know, right out of the box, no. Uh, I think third-party software and a third-party hardware device might be uh, the best uh, the best bet there. Yeah, Noble, that's, you make a great point. There are actually companies that are working on true augmented reality, um, and uh, one is called Meta, and they're coming up with some really interesting devices. But the problem there is you need to know, you need to evaluate the anatomy first in order to overlay it accurately. Uh, and match it. But I think where today, right out of the box, glass would be useful for the phlebotomist is simply, you know, as they're going down the hall in the uh, hospital from room to room, oftentimes, you know, they, they need to know which labs to draw on which patients. Right now, they have sheets of paper that they look at and follow. And I know this is always frustrating as a resident, is you'd always want to add a lab uh, last minute. And right now, the those labs never make it to the phlebotomist, but if you some a phlebotomist was wearing glass, they could get last minute updates saying, you know, please go back to room 32B uh, to draw potassium. So that's where I think it would be uh, most useful for a true augmented reality. Glass isn't isn't the right uh, form factor. Gang, um, we're we're nearing the end of our tweet chat. I wanna I wanna see if we can enter a lightning round here. I'm gonna mix two topics, and I want us to maybe go as quick as we can and share our thoughts about glass in two areas. One is we we've talked again. I brought this up a few times. Uh, this is an elite group. Will will glass come down in price? I know that's a bit of speculation about Google, but maybe are there other technologies? I think about my hundred and fifty dollar Pebble watch and the fact that it shows a, a different type of. Uh, kind of wrist up display, right? Are there things like glass or other things that will um, uh, have maybe a wider applicability, maybe even global health applicability in areas that are underserved? And I'm curious if anybody wants to talk about the economics and, and global health in underserved communities here. 
I can I can start. Um, I think that uh, there, you know, Glass is one of many, hopefully, <laughs> uh, hardware devices that are head mountable that are going to come to the market. There are going to be different form factors for different use cases. Uh, I think each use case will have a unique um, need and and market to serve. Uh, I believe uh, the patients there by uh, would have to to sort of evaluate what they actually want to accomplish um, with it. If I just want to be able to count my steps, perhaps getting a full-on Google Glass device or a Meta uh, uh, AR device isn't the best way uh, to go and probably not the most cost-effective way. Uh, Glass is not the cheapest device. I doubt it will be um, as cheap as a Fitbit, for example, and it won't be as expensive, hopefully, as a an iPad. And hopefully... Um, you know the market sort of judges as to you know what they would like to uh, to purchase based on what they need. Dr. Grossman, uh, you talked about telementoring, about using this in medical education. Uh, any applicabilities for for training either providers or maybe even patients or or um, maybe folks in the community level for uh, providing care in third world countries? Absolutely, especially in patients that, in areas that are underserved, and and uh, you know I think price is not an issue. I think that price will exponentially come down, like it always does for any devices. I really think that the Google Glass or any other similar device, like Noble was saying, uh, uh, you know, uh, Glass is really the natural evolution of the computing device. Well, we had big computers to PCs to laptops to tablets to watches to smartphones and now to wearable devices in the form of, of Meta or Glass or whatnot. So I think that it will be common to use this platform as the platform to connect and especially in areas that, that need the connectivity to improve communication, to improve connectivity with uh, areas that have expertise. I absolutely think that that's the future for that sort of areas, you know, to be able to, to get the, the care and the education that they need. Um, well, I mean, I think they, they touched on an important point, but the, the way I see it is, is as follows. And we are entering the wearable era. Uh, we're going to be, if you just see the Consumer Electronics Show uh, this year, 155,000 attendees. 40% of the display was for digital health. Sensors are growing. We are seeing a live core. We're seeing the iMetra from MIT, which gives you optometric uh, results for $5. We're seeing ISPO2. We're seeing all these parameters that are now being monitored that are going to be incorporated to a certain extent in your phone via platform. Now you've got IBM who will be releasing Watson soon enough as a cloud uh, AI. So now you tell me, once you start incorporating all this data, and as Noble mentioned, okay, it depends on your goal, but if you're a patient and you have a goal and you're monitoring all these parameters, and now you incorporate artificial intelligence there, you're going to be getting some nice nifty advice from from artificial intelligence, which I mean, if you if you see the the publications, they're actually doing pretty good diagnostic tests uh, and uh, recommendations on therapies. So, when you start incorporating everything and you go to third world countries, this is going to have tremendous potential on care on on people. And I'm very excited to see what's what's going to be happening. And once we get uh, uh, minds um, excited in this way and working on it. It's going to be, uh, I think it's going to be a very interesting future. You know, I just wanted to comment that um, one of the largest projected costs in healthcare in the 21st century, ironically, it's not congestive heart failure, it's not diabetes, it's not orthopedic care, oncology. It actually lies in cognitive decline and dementia in the 21st century. And I think you're going to see certainly wearable technologies, whether they're going to be uh, head-mounted or not, remains to be seen. But we certainly will see the wearables trying to crack into that phase of life in which we try to maintain the elderly in an independent fashion before they actually require uh, dependency and institutionalization. That is a very large cost, and I hope that uh, the wearables themselves will make a significant dent in that part of our healthcare expenditures in the U.S. We, we have had a great conversation tonight, guys. I think we've only begun to scratch the surface of this. I'd suggest this is the kinds of things we talk about at Medicine X, 
Everybody ought to come out to Stanford in September. We ought to continue this dialogue. We ought to think of more patient-centered uses, community uses, provider uses. Uh, Noble Ackerson, Raphael Grossman, Christian Assad, um, Oliver Alami, and Pierre Theodore, thank you for joining us tonight. We're out of time. We'll see you guys next Tuesday. We'll see you this Thursday for the next episode of, uh, of Stanford's class and next Tuesday for the Hangout. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks Thank so you. much okay. for joining us tonight for this episode of Stanford MedX Live. We'll see you back here on March 11th, 2014 at 5.30 p.m. <coughs> when we'll discuss the topic Design and the Patient Experience, moderated by Lisa Bernstein, with a panel of healthcare designers as well as patients from providers interested in design that include Katie McCurdy, Nick Dawson, Britt Johnson, and Kyra Bobinette. You won't want to miss this next episode of Stanford Medicine X Live. As a reminder, Stanford MedX Live is made possible by support from the Stanford University School of Medicine Department of Anesthesia, Stanford AIM Lab, Stanford Hospital and Clinics, and the Agency for Healthcare Research Quality. If you haven't yet done so, please take a moment to like our Facebook page at www.facebook.com forward slash Stanford MedX so you can continue the conversation online and stay informed of program updates. From all of us here at Stanford Medicine X, we want to thank you for joining us today and remind you to join us again this Thursday, March 6th at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time for another edition of Stanford MedX Live featuring a new patient engagement design class in the Stanford University School of Medicine called Engage and Empower Me. This week, we're featuring Chris Hogg Rick Valencia, and Ernesto Ramirez, along with e-patient speaker and moderator Hugo Campos. And the topic of the class is going to be on self-tracking for behavior change. For all of you out there taking time to tune in with us tonight, thank you so much for joining us and being part of the conversation. A special thanks to our guest panelists this evening. And from all of us at Stanford Medicine X, we'll see you next time.